Um, I think some of the earlier questions related to the greenhouse gas potential, and this is something I, I can answer to. I think um, one of the questions was the relative importance and potency. So there is a resource um, that the IPCC or uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Life uh, on, on Climate Change actually uh, does a good job, and I, I will uh, put it as a response, but also to um, and I will be putting it in the it is in the Q&A, but it is really lists the potency of these gases and some of the higher hydrocarbons have a much higher in the hundreds or thousands carbon dioxide equivalents. So really, these gases are emitted in such small quantities, but can have a very high um, climate global climate change potential. Um, I think also some of the questions that we've received relates to um, the I think that that question was for you, Patrick, about the prices um, in dollars per um, uh, short ton or dollars per ton. Is that a metric tons or short tons typically that you've quoted us? Yeah, um, in almost all carbon markets, everything is done in metric tons because they're intended to be international markets. Um, so almost everything metric tons. There is one market in the US called the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. No farms create credit through it, but um, for some reason they use short time. So. Excellent, thank you. I think also we had a couple of questions related to converting. Um, so one question relates to converting from a biogas that does the combined heat and power or CHP to an RNG or renewable natural gas for a pipeline for carbon markets. Is that considered additional or um, how is it treated? Sure, how I can start. And if you wanna chime in, feel free. Sure. So each different program uh, writes their own rules for additionality. And um, the big push to have biogas used for RNG in the US is driven by EPA's renewable fuel standard. Um, and California's low carbon fuel standard primarily, and then also by Oregon's clean fuel standard, but Oregon doesn't consume nearly as much fuel as California does, so the California market uh, has been a much bigger driver. California wrote their rules uh, to say that as long as there is not a regulatory mandate to require um, installation of a digester that everything is additional. And so um, in addition, California's goal with the low carbon fuel standard is to get low carbon fuels being used for transportation. So if a uh, dairy was, uh, or Swan Farm was producing electricity in a CHP unit, um, and that was going onto the electricity grid, and then they converted to renewable natural gas, and there was a contractual pathway to get that gas used in California, California would consider that a new and additional activity because that is new low carbon fuel coming into California to meet their goals. Yeah, and if you're looking at it from the offset side, um, how you destroy the gas is kind of in some ways immaterial. Um, if you burn it in a flare, if you put it in an engine, or you put it in a pipeline, um, the key is you have to have the gas destroyed. Um, so as long as the gas is getting burnt, um, then from the offset side, I think, you know, your, your end use for the gas can be either one of those. Um, and then, you know, what Patrick said for the LCFS markets, uh, I think holds true. Perfect. Thank you, Patrick Hal. Um, I think also some of the questions, I think I have a, I see a question from uh, Jessica related to adjustments for the current carbon markets or what are the challenges that the current structure of carbon markets are facing from your own perspectives? Um, you want to start that one, Hal? Give you your perspective. I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? What are the biggest adjustments that needs to be made for the car current carbon markets in order to move forward or to basically grow or advance? So, right right now, I think the carbon markets are as you know a hot of a, a thing as they can be. Um, so, 
Um, I'm not sure, you know, exactly what you mean by advancing or, or whatever, but, um, you know, right now, I think they're very healthy markets. The, the rates that these um, projects are, are paying back to the people who are investing in them um, seem to be, uh, you know, based on the activity we, you know, the calls and everything we get from people, um, I, you know, I think it's a very, very healthy kind of market right now. Um, it depends on, you know, there are there are definitely some uh, stumbling blocks um, along the way. And I think the registries do a, a really nice job on trying to correct some of those stumbling blocks. Um, so, you know, when there's regulatory issues, it used to be if there's any kind of regulatory issue on the farm, then they lose the whole reporting period worth of credits. And then they kind of reevaluated that and said, no, let's just, you know, chop off the part that the farm, you know, if the farm had a free board violation or something in one of their bonds, then, you know, for a week, then they just lose the credits for that week. So, um, you know, there are continuous improvements being made to the program by all the interested parties. So I think, um, you know, it, it, it does seem like a, a pretty healthy um, uh, industry, I guess. Yeah, I, I, I agree with Hal on all those things, and we'll also speak to a couple um, adjustments that would be good. So, uh, and that that we hope to see. So, Cal, speaking just sort of on a smaller scale first with California's low carbon fuel standard, the price has dropped over a couple of years from two hundred dollars a ton to sixty. And the reason for that is because there is so much ultra low carbon dairy renewable natural gas being produced. And there's a lot of renewable diesel being produced from crops, um, millions, billions of gallons of it. So that is, uh, it's not biodiesel that congeals when it's cold. It is diesel fuel that is called a drop in fuel. It's chemically equivalent to fossil diesel. And so it has essentially flooded the low carbon fuel standard market with uh, supply and there's not enough demand to keep up. So carb is, uh, demand is driven by the target of the whole program, which is to reduce the carbon intensity of average fuel in California, 20% by 2030, and carbs in the process of uh, rulemaking to strengthen that target, to take it up to maybe 25%, maybe 30, maybe 35%. So when they increase demand, market price should come back up, and, um, and that will they want the price to be high, but not too high that it's going to impact um, costs to consumers at the pump too much, but they want it to be high in order to drive private investment. So that's one adjustment. I think the other on a more global scale is how to scale up voluntary markets. There are many protocols that have been used, um, but there are some that have just failed. They were too complicated. But if we think about the scale of the problem and the urgency of the problem uh, and the fact that um, many people all over the world, certainly not everybody, but many people really want to drive resources to this quickly, how would you go from having um, a relatively small number of fields in the US currently producing soil carbon credit to having many millions of acres uh, doing it quickly? And how would you manage the integrity issues of double counting and uh, things like that uh, in, if you were gonna scale up quickly? So there are people, lots of people working on those challenges and those questions. There are organizations dedicated to it, like the Voluntary Carbon Markets Integrity Initiative. And then the other one, the acronym's escaping me right now, but um, so I think those are some of the adjustments that we hope to see. Perfect. Thank you. Um, I, I think another follow-up question related to your um, perspectives, uh, both of you, is the insights on the why the prices of credits are lower now and are anaerobic digester projects um, still financially viable at these costs? Yeah, I think Patrick just um, maybe answered part of that. Um, Patrick, I'll let you talk about whether they're they're financially viable. I, I suspect they are because we keep getting calls about it. But uh, Patrick, maybe maybe you can speak to that. 
Sure. So yeah, I would say that it's only the prices of LTFS credits that have dropped in all of the other markets. Um, generally, well, the RIN market uh, ebbs and flows and it was at historic highs and is not at uh, those historic highs anymore. But um, in just creating carbon offset, which many people have transitioned away from because they weren't as valuable, but those credits keep getting more and more valuable. Um, projects are still economically viable. And somebody else I saw earlier asked, where is all the money going? Um, when LCFS credits were at $200 a ton and you could stack EPA renewable fuel standard credits on top of those, it was kind of like multiplying the value that projects were seeing in 2012, 40 fold. So there was, um, my company doesn't invest capital. We don't advise people who invest capital. We don't have a rate of return that we think is economically viable. That varies from, from capital provider to other project developer. Um, we just help people create the credits, but certainly the returns are not as great when projects, when market prices were at the highest ever, but uh, they are still viable. And there's lots of reasons to think that market prices are uh, for the LCFS are going to come back up uh, over time. Thank you, Patrick. Um, and I'm looking through and it does seem like uh, you all did a great job addressing many of the questions that um, remain open. I don't see any other questions that uh, need to be addressed um, remotely or offline. I think um, with that, I, I want to uh, thank you both, Hal and Patrick, for sharing your time and insights on this topic. And uh...